Yeah, it's encouraging. Thank you for my introduction. <laughs> I, I do consider Richard a good friend also, and uh, he's been a blessing to me over the years as Rachel and I have entered into Kaiapo ministry and, and working as missionaries. And that's been a huge blessing in my life, just encouragement. Every time I come up here, I have you know, an encouraging word for me, and I, you know, it's just good, it's refreshing to have a, have a friend. You know, you have a brother in the Lord. Amen. So um, I'm glad to be here this morning. Um, I wanted to give, I do want to give a little bit of an update of what's happening at Purdue University. Um, for some, of, some of you guys get our updates and things like that, some of you don't, it's fine. Um, but um, God is doing neat things down at Purdue. Um, some of you guys are familiar because I've been here before, some of you aren't, so I'll just explain it for you. But uh, Purdue University is a, a, is a campus of of 38,000, kind of like, uh, it's a big Big Ten university, just like you guys have here, UW, and um, and in the, at the university, there's uh, 38,000 students, but our, one of the awesome things, I think, is the fact that we have 9,000 uh, international students that attend our university, so um, that includes numbers like there's uh, 3,200 Chinese students there, there's um, 1,500 Indian uh, students there, there's what is the third largest? Uh, but um, uh, the university is full of international students, and it's great because we get to share the gospel um, with students from nations that uh, have never heard the gospel before, have never maybe had a Bible, have grown up atheist, um, just because there's in China the society is atheistic, and so maybe they've never just been open to a Bible, have it in their own language, or things like that, so then we get to share that hope of the gospel with them, and and they receive it. And it's so amazing to see lives being changed. I've mentioned a couple different times that I've been here, my my good friend Hao and Chong, and um, Hao gave his life to the Lord in October, Chong gave his life um, to the Lord in uh, February, was when he made that decision, and and now we meet every week, and we still meet. Uh, this week, we were the last couple weeks, we watched the NBA Finals together. Um, that's been really good. But we also get together once a week, and we really believe in discipleship and just training um, students how to follow the Lord. And you know, the, the passage in, in Matthew, the Great Commission, go and make disciples by telling them everything I've taught you. So I want to, when I, when Hao and Chong came to know the Lord, they made the decision to follow Him. I don't want to just leave them at at that point, because there's so much more to who God is and, and what He's revealed. So I'm, I now have the responsibility to decide them, to teach them what God has revealed to me. And so it's, it's a really neat thing that we get to do every every Wednesday at 3 o'clock. We meet Hao and Chong and I in his, in his office, and it's great. And uh, God is doing neat things like that. This summer, we also had one of our students, his name is Manny, and he's from Nigeria. And he had a Chinese roommate named Michael. And um, Michael had been, he had been taking like a English as a second language class. And the English as a second language, his um, instructor, his teacher, was a born again believer. And so every, every time that they met together to talk about uh, English and do the courses, he would bring Jesus into the conversation every time. And so he had been, um, and it's funny, I, uh, the, the guy that Michael had been talking to, his name is Andrew also. Um, and so Andrew had been witnessing to him for about a year, and Manny is part of our ministry. Andrew is part of another ministry, but Manny is part of our ministry, and he was his roommate. And so um, and Manny started to invite him to some of our fellowship events, and just two weeks ago now, um, Michael made a decision for Jesus um, at, our, at our Friday night meeting. And, um, and now Josh, uh, Josh is from uh, uh, Tanzania, Manny is from Nigeria, and they're now pouring into Michael and just like them, taking them out to lunch and bringing their Bible and just saying, hey, what kind of question do you have? Here's the baby. I met with all four of them last week, and we shared our personal testimonies when the day was that we made the decision, oh yeah, I need to ask Jesus to forgive me, and I need to make a decision to follow him. So we all shared our testimony, and then this, this week, um, just on Friday, they, I saw them meeting in our union, and I was like, oh, this is awesome. It's, it's not just about uh, you know me doing the ministry there, or the uh, I have I'm with a Rachel and I are with a group of missionaries, but we're not doing it alone. Um, but our heart is that it's not us as ministers that want to 
always have to be the ones connecting with people, but that the, the body of Christ, the believers, would also take the responsibility to go make disciples and take responsibility for the new believers. So that's um, a little, little tidbit of what's going on, the newest stuff, Purdue University. Um, but this morning, I really, um, I was really lost what, what God wanted to say. I was like, you know, I come up here every once in a while and I'm really excited about something, you know, and I share it with you guys. I'm like, oh, this is what God's doing and showing me here. And I just, you know, share it all. And I was like, you know, God, I, uh, and, and, you know, that's you know, a good thing that I, I need to encourage people. And that's good. And I said, God, God what, what is your message this morning? And, um, so when that happens and you stay up till 4 a.m. last night, Sometimes things don't always flow together because um, my mind like, blank a little bit. But I know what God wants to say. So if you have your Bibles, um, let's open to Psalms 51. This one.
I know when, uh, whenever you go and, and look at a word, what's the first thing you're supposed to do when you look at a word and you're like, okay, what the hell? I need to know the understanding of this word. I usually pull out a dictionary, right? I had a, we had a, when I was really small, we had a children's dictionary with little pictures, you know, and then you get a little older and mom and dad used to have this really big, like, old dictionary. It was like, the pages were kind of like crinkly and it was like delicate to open and it was like like the big person's dictionary. Um, now we have the internet, so I just go to the internet and pull up all sorts of definitions, so it's a little easier um, to, to do some studies. Um, a little plug. Um, for a, a great tool that will help you um, study and, and know the word more is it's a, a website called um, blueletterbible.com. Um, it is a great, great resource. If, if you haven't heard of it, write it down, take note of it, blueletterbible.com. It's an awesome resource. Um, if you need um, help, I think Dad is familiar with the website, but it, it, there's Important on there it helps you dig deeper. I love um, part of it also on there. There's, um, and I won't get into the, the description of it. You guys aren't looking at it. But um, anyway, there's an there's a option there to look at all the different scripture references. When you're looking at one specific verse, you can look at all of the, uh, the related verses in the whole Bible. And it just really helps you get that full revelation of, of what the scripture is saying and, and bring more and more meaning to these things. So anyway, I got on the internet and um, wanted, okay, what is a Webster, Webster you know, definition of mercy? So this is, the, this is their the Webster definition. A compassion or forbearance shown especially to an offender or to one subject to one's power. I was like, well, sometimes I need a little help even understanding the definition of it. Of the heart, right? <laughs> so, did we, we'll catch this. I'll say it again. Mercy, if we look at Webster, says it's the compassion or forbearance shown especially to an offender or to one subject to one's power. So, I was thinking, okay, I was thinking about that game, mercy. And I'm like, okay, well, how do I fit that into this definition when I'm crying out for mercy and, and, and I'm, you know, rioting in pain? You know, what, what, where is mercy? So, you see the. The person who is causing the pain, I like this, the second part of this definition, is especially compassion or forbearance, or compassion is love, being kind, like those, again, right? So, this, but the second part of the definition really helps us understand mercy, especially to an offender. So somebody that has offended us, caused an offense, um, hurt us personally, whether it be emotionally, physically, uh, an offender, somebody that has done something against me. So it's, it's showing compassion and forbearance, especially to an offender. But the second part of this is really powerful to think about. Or to one that is subject to one's power. So mercy, one that is subject to one's power. I'm playing the game. I'm totally subject. If I don't call mercy, or, or if the person doesn't choose to give me mercy, right? Knuckles broke, fingers broke, you know, it's, it's a bad news kind of thing. I get hurt. So I was um, putting this in my own words. I, I said, mercy is showing love. Right? Love is, um, love doesn't think about self. We can go to the, the Corinthians 13 passage, love doesn't think about self. Love is self-sacrificial. It thinks about the others. Good, you know. I want to think about the love of God. And what was his, What was the demonstration of the love of God? He sent his son Jesus to die for us. That's a demonstration. He he died for a friend. Um, John fifteen, um, John fifteen thirty eight, John fifteen thirteen says, "No greater love has um, this than that a man would lay down his life for a friend." You know, love is just, it's laying down something of myself for the person. So, mercy, I was thinking, mercy is showing love, withholding nothing. Showing compassion, withholding nothing. But, one thing, it's judgment. So, mercy is when somebody, sh when somebody shows love, full of love, 
withholding absolutely nothing. It's Desh our love. But judgment. So in their love, there is no judgment. To one who is subject to one's power. The one who has power has the right. Somehow you can use that power, you can use the word authority. The one that has power or the authority has the right to judge, has the right to act justly, has the right to inflict punishment. But mercy is showing love, choosing to show love even when they have the right to judge or to bring, uh, bring, ju bring um, justice or, or, or to cause the pain even. So when, I, when we look at um, how does this relate, David here, David cries out to the Lord, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. What is, this, what is this transgression? this transgression, this sin? So we, um, if you know the story of David, uh, David uh, had, had an affair with Bathsheba, right? Had a, even had a child out of wedlock. And um, in, in this thing, um, David is confronted by a prophet, Nathaniel. And Nathaniel comes to David and he says, David, something's going up. Do you want to tell me or do you want me to tell you? Who he said? And David, and David immediately realizes and, and you can, um, we can look at that account. But this is, uh, Psalms 51 is the record now. He's caught. David has committed a sin, and God has the right to judge David. He has the right uh, to destroy David. He, God has the right to destroy sin. He is holy God, and he is the judge. And we know that as believers, that one day, as well, everybody, well, one day, Hebrews said that we are all destined to die and then face judgment. Who is that final judge? It's it is God. He's the one that has the right to judge. And so David here, caught in his sin, and he pleads to God. He said, have mercy on me. Show me love and compassion, because I know that's who you are. Even though you have the right to judge me. I wanted to uh, take a moment and I know this may be different for Sunday morning service, but I believe we're a body of believers together. You know, we can encourage one another and, and share. And you guys are really good at fellowship, talking, have a picnic next week. You're going to have the joint service. But um, can we take a moment now, as we're thinking about this um, moment of David. David is caught in sin, and he uh, cries out for mercy. And as we uh, read the... If we, read the whole psalm here, we find that, uh, and, we, and we study the life of David, we find that, that God does give mercy to him. Um, so this morning, I would like to do something different. Since I'm in Chi Alpha, and we do this a lot with students, we get together in groups, and we kind of discuss different aspects of the sermon. Um, so what I'd like to do is if we could get in groups of four, right in the middle of the sermon, and discuss what has been the, the uh, most merciful act that somebody, uh, or, or what has been the greatest um, act of mercy shown to you. Does that make sense? The greatest act of mercy shown to you. So I was, I um, recently was talking with a student, and he was telling me, one time I was driving with my permit, I had my permit, and I was driving in the state of Illinois, and I got pulled over by a cop. And when I got pulled over, I got a cop, I realized I didn't have my proof insurance. I'm, I have my permit, and I'm in another state. That's not, uh, not good. It's past curfew. He was going 17 miles per hour over the speed limit, and he didn't have his driver's license. And there's like two other things that he was saying that, um, that he, under law, deserved punishment. Make a ticket, jail time, car taken away, everything. And for whatever reason, <laughs> I've got to meet this cop. But 
he showed mercy and let him go with the warning. What? That's a crazy story. So I want us to get in groups of four real quick and share what has been the greatest act of mercy shown to us. And I want to, and, and, I'll, and I'll say one brief description outside of God's mercy that he's shown you. Okay, so we know, um, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the mercy that God's shown us, but if you're a believer in this morning and you understand the mercy that you receive from God, outside of that, what is the greatest act of mercy, whether it be from your parents, a third figure, whatever it was, that you've been shown? Can we do that? Okay. Ready? Go. Grade school. I don't know if I was in first or second grade. Mom and Dad know the details of this a little bit better. But um, I, I decided, well, I, my school teacher would always give um, homework packets. And they were like 25 spelling words. We had to like write them out multiple times, you know, and then, then we had to define them and we had to write a story with them, things like that. And I don't know how long this went. Um, but somewhere along the line, I decided that I didn't want to do my homework packets anymore. I was like, I hated sitting at the table every week and doing the same thing to the same work. And I'm like, I can pass the spelling test at the end of the week even without doing all this homework. Why do I have to do this stuff? And so um, I just went on for a while and stuffed them in my desk and, and they were piling up and um, I told a whole bunch of lies and to see about, um, yeah, I did it. I already did my homework. I mean, I was just told to see. I don't remember what um, went on at home uh, about that situation, um, but I do remember <laughs> receiving a lot of mercy from my school teacher. Um, not. I mean, she had every right, if we talk about right authority and their right and their, their ability to bring them in. Um, I, when I'm thinking about it, I think it was like at least two months of homework that I didn't do. At least two months. She should have failed me. I did not deserve it. I did not do my work. And um, I passed. Somehow, the mercy was shown to me. <laughs> and, and I passed the grade. But I remember that every time I think about mercy, I think about that story, and I was like, what was I thinking? But um, anyway, who else would like to share maybe their story? Um, you know, we were in different groups, so maybe we don't, but whatever, could we have that? maybe at least two people share their story of the greatest act of mercy shown to them? Who thinks they had a good one? Or who thinks somebody else had a good one and needs to like, not just like, hey, share yours. Okay, oh yeah. I'm, I'm not sure it started when I, when I, when I was raised up. When I, when, I, when I was living in China. Uh, you know, in China we have a tradition. So every, every, every New Year at the student festival, we recite fireworks, we recite a phrase for the New Year. It, it's very happy for, 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 for children. Like when I, when, I, when I was nine or eight years. So we were, we were very excited. But one, one obvious city, one bad side of, of saying fireworks is my side of fireworks. To people's houses or <laughs> yeah, neighbors. So my parents warned me a lot when they know that we're going out for playing with the fireworks. They say, be careful when you fire fireworks because some of the one type of fireworks can like half half the fire drops, you know, moves very far away. So it, it can it can leave the house, you know, like several tens or hundred meters away. So it should be very careful about that. But you know, we're just too young. <laughs> So we don't care about that. <laughs> we just play by ourselves and they'll just, you know, ah, yeah, we're very, very happy. So that was an act. So basically, uh, we managed to get a fire in the house. And uh, what was uh, really bad is there's no one leaving the house. Why is that? Because no one, no one can, can find out that except for us. So we're, we're kids, and, but we don't know what to do because we, we just panic. We're, we're in panic. So we don't know what to do. So I think that's. The, the moment we, we realize how dangerous fireworks is, um, so uh, you know now I just re I, I just remember actually my dad he found out that 
and he actually let a bunch of people bring that house and put out the fire to us. So, and when I, <coughs> when I got returned home, and I, I was sitting in the chair like, uh, <laughs> I think he will, he will be the least person that showed mercy to me because he was excited into that house and put out the fire. And that was really like, like you know, taking responsibility for me. So I, I think he would probably give you up because he, I think uh, he, he would be very angry, but he, he did. He didn't do, like, he, 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 he didn't speak me up. He just said, you should, be, you should realize the, con the consequence of the things you have. And you, 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 you are growing up, so you should, be, you should know that you, you're going to be responsible for that consequence. In, in the future, when you really grow up, there could be no always there, 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 there cannot be always some person like me to go and try to ask. <laughs> That's exactly what, what he said. So, Sounds like a really good dad. Yeah, he's, he's, I think he's a very good dad. A really good he dad. He showed mercy to me. He, he didn't beat me. He didn't beat me. But what I, what I think is I, I do there is from the mercy. That's my story. I'm sure that's right. That's great. Thank you, Leo. Yeah. Is there one other story that um, I'd like to share of the greatest act of mercy ever shown to us? really appreciate you sharing that. I know it's, it's easier to share when you're a little group of four than in front of everybody. I know that. Okay. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Where is Rajiv at? Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I heard there's, I heard there's um, bacon going to be at the picnic on Saturday, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Bacon at the picnic. <laughs> so come to the picnic. There'll be bacon. Um, Rachel, you want to share your story? I would love if somebody from Capital City would share their story. Dad, what was that? What? Angel. Angel, that's a good story? Angel, is that a good story? Come on, Angel. Share with your brother and sister. I don't know. I people ahead of time, putting you on the spot. So, um, at 5.30 in the morning, I show up to work one morning, and um, I'm, uh, I'm about to head to a job. It's 5.30 in the morning, tired and stuff. And so, uh, as I'm pulling out of the, uh, the warehouse with the company truck, I, um, I scraped the whole side of the company truck and, <laughs> and the um, brand new garage door track frame, right? So I just caused a lot of damage. Sure. Um, but the thing about it was that um, just prior to that garage door was just replaced uh, because another worker damaged it and he had to pay to, to fix it. Uh, so about a month later, I don't only damage, the, the, the worker damaged the garage door only. I damaged the door and the truck. <laughs> so, um, so I was just, I was, I was kind of bummed out about it. I, I knew it was going to be more than I could afford. Um, so I was just, you know, stressed out about it. And you know, I usually call my pastor. He help me out with that. Right? <laughs> help me out with that. So I called my pastor, um, and not to my surprise, he told me that I need to go and tell the owner that I would pay for all the damages to the truck and the garage door. So I didn't want to do that. <laughs> I quit and do that. <laughs> um, but I did. I offered to pay for it. Um, he said, okay. A week went by and he called me into the office and he said, uh, I was looking to get rid of that truck, Angel. We're in need of a new one. Don't worry about the truck. 
and as far as the garage door, um, I bent it back into place, and so we'll just run with it like that. Hey, wow. Hey. all been in situations just like David. We're caught in our sin and we know we deserve punishment. And it is right, right? I mean, I could have failed the grade. We could have, we could have, that would have been a big bill, right? I mean, like, and, and it was, oh, it was right for, for if that, if that authority figure, your boss, would have said, pay for this as a bill, it's right, it's the right judgment. He showed mercy. Show mercy, show love and compassion, withholding judgment. And what was awesome, as, I, as I've been sharing it all, looking at that story of David, and, and the fact that David had sinned, and God is a holy God, and he has a right to judge and bring judgment to David. And you know what? He has a right to hold his judgment over us. God is full of mercy and abounding in love. So God sees our sin and chose, like as you pointed that out in the worship, God made a decision too. He chose to show mercy to us by sending His Son. And Romans um, three, uh, in Romans it says, "The wages of sin are death." But the gift of God is eternal life. So the wages of our sin, the penalty for the fact that we have sinned, David had sinned, Andrew Castro has sinned, lying to his parents. The penalty is death, is separation from God, it's judgment. But he gives us life through Jesus. And as I was thinking about that, um, I was thinking, God, why do you do this? Why did you choose to show mercy to me? And you know, and I kept on, I kept on coming back. He, he loves. He's full of love. He's full of love. Um, if we read Psalm fifty-one, I want to read this real, real quickly. <clears throat> he says, "Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love, according to the great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions." So you know when, when. When we, when we were coming to God with our sin, we're, he's, he's telling him, I know that I was a sinner. I, mean, I know these things. But, and surely, in verse 5, it says, Surely I was sinful at birth and sinful from the time I, my mother conceived me. And he, and he goes on. He says, I deserve this. I deserve this. And, and he asks God in verse 10, Create in me, O God, a, a pure heart. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. And then in verse 14, he says, Save me from my blood guilt, the guilt of, of what I'm going through. Save me from this, O God. The God who saves. And then, you know, and, and David's, and as I read the book of Psalms, I love it because he, David begins to pour out his heart. He tells God how angry he is. He, he confesses things. He sends them. He confesses, oh, God, I know that you're righteous and, and I deserve these things. And then at the end of the Psalms, he's, he, he many times will mention a characteristic of God. He gets back to the, the character of God. And he does this again here. Sinners will come back to you. Save me from my guilt, uh, blood guilt, my guilt, because God, you save. My tongue will sing your righteousness. You don't delight in sacrifice. You don't take pleasure in burnt offering. But you delight in a broken and contrite heart, God. You will not despise those things. It is your good pleasure to make us prosper. It's his good pleasure to show us mercy. God wants to show us mercy. And as I look through the Old Testament and look at mercy in the Old Testament, there was many um, aspects of, of mercy in the Old Testament where it was God showing. Pleading, people were pleading for, uh, for God's mercy because they understood the judgment of God and the separation of God. And they were like pleading for his mercy. And, and it also talks about mercy and, and emphasizing the kindness of mercy and, and that we can also share, show mercy to people. Um, uh, you know, have you ever met somebody that is, that is, um, mercy, I would say they're mercy driven, or like if we look at Romans 12, the gift of mercy, they have like this gift of compassion, they're just really compassionate people, I would say my dad is probably 
it, like that, that, that compassion, like you just give things to people. We have a student in, at Purdue University, his name's Radon, and he is, he is like mercy, he flows in compassion. You know, um, I use this illustration of a, of a skateboarder, you know, rolling across the thing out there and he's doing, doing a trick on a skateboard and he falls and he maybe he cuts himself, right? And, and Radon, because of, because of his mercy gifting, would run out to that skateboarder and be like, are you okay? You know, and, and, and care for him. If he needed, if he needed, um, you know, new clothing, he tore his clothes, he offered his clothes. If, you know, he was bloody, he would try to, he would try to show, show mercy and, and he would just be full of love towards him. And then, uh, you know, sometimes myself, I, I tend usually not to think that way. When I see somebody, and maybe some of you guys identify with this, when I see somebody out there skateboarding and they don't have a helmet on, they don't have pads, and they're doing some, some crazy trick and they trip and they fall and they break, you know, whatever, they're bloody on that thing. My first instinct, you know what it usually is? That was stupid. <laughs> what were they thinking? You know, and, and, and it shows that it's a, it's a, different, it's a difference of, of the way we're gifted. And Radon, though, I, when I see Radon in action, I, I see it just like, just like God, where he just, he would go and care for that person, no matter the, the decision that they make. He shows love withholding judgment. And there's a theme that picks up in the New Testament that I wanted us this morning, I believe God also wanted us to hear. We've talked a lot about the fact that God has the right to judge, but he chooses to show mercy when we cry out for mercy. I want to take us to 1 Timothy. And I say, why does, why does God you know, want to show us mercy? There's, you know, an aspect of why he wants to show us mercy because he loves us and he wants a relationship with us. He desires like your father. He's, the Bible describes God as a, as a father. He's a good father. He's a, you know, you ask your, your earthly father to for gifts and your earthly father doesn't give you a scorpion or give you something something terrible when you ask him for something. And it, and it says, how much more will your heavenly father give you good gifts, right? So our, our heavenly father is good. He, he desires a relationship with us. You know that? He, he desires relationship, commune with us. He, he desires for us to, you know, I used to, I used to get up in my, my daddy's lap and just snuggle with daddy. I still call daddy, daddy sometimes. You know, our Heavenly Father is just like that. We are his sons and his daughters. And he, he is really a us. <coughs> and he shows mercy to us because he really loves us. He has a right to it. And there's, there's, this, there's a, another aspect here in, in, in 1 Timothy also that Paul talks about the mercy that he was shown. About, and Paul says that he's the chief of sinners. He was the worst of all sinners. Yet, Paul was shown mercy. And he talks about it here in 1 Timothy. And starting in verse 13. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 13. It says, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. Verse 16, but for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display in his unlimited patience an example 
for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. So that's a really wordy passage, but let's, let's think about this for a second. So Paul says, I was the worst of sinner, but I was shown mercy. And part of that mercy is because it because I, my, his relationship with God is now restored. But the, there's a second part to why he was shown mercy. What is that? It's for those that still need to receive mercy. There's people around, unbelievers, that are in their sin. And like I said in Hebrews, it says that we are all to die once and then face judgment. That we're all going to come to the day of judgment. And if we have not chosen beforehand, to make a decision to follow Christ and to receive the mercy. We have to make the decision, the choice. Are we going to receive the mercy that God wants to give to us or show to us? When we make that decision, it's so other people can see the mercy of God in our lives. So this morning, um, if we can come back, this morning, um, I wanted to touch on, or God was speaking one last aspect of this all to me. And I think this is one of the really important parts. And I think everything from his word is important. God has shown us so much mercy. God has to 
declare forgiveness. We are all forgiven at the cross. Being unmerciful is to say to somebody that they have not been forgiven or to hold unforgiveness toward somebody. why we hold unforgiveness or the reason why we're unmerciful is we are hurt. We don't want to show mercy because we're really hurt. And you know what? Sometimes it feels like we have a right to hold judgment against somebody instead of sharing the mercy that we were shown and that's already been shown for that person by God. So by being unmerciful, we're taking God's position. And what's, what's so terrible about that? That's another verse of the day, shall receive mercy.
John, I forgive you for this. I hold nothing against you because God has shown me mercy and I want to extend that same mercy to you. And you can pray a simple prayer like that.